Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor. And one of the questions that I get from my students all the time is how do I remember all these reactions that I'm covering in my class? Well, there are two different methods how you can do that. Well, actually three methods. One, you can use flashcards and I will talk about that at some other time. The other one, you can make a list of different reactions and try to memorize it this way. And finally, there is another way that I have here on the screen and that is going to be a spider web of all of your different reactions. Actions. So you can take some sort of a starting material, and here I have this alkene, and then try to come up with all different possible reactions that you would know for the alkene, and try to see what type of reagents you need and what type of products you are going to get. So here I drew a whole bunch of different products, and we would want to know what type of reagents we need in this case. The benefit of this method is that it helps you to visualize the different transformations that you can have for your molecules and for your different functions groups and it makes it easier to bridge the gap between the reactions and the synthesis that you are going to be able to do at the end of the course using all of those different reactions. So let's go through these reactions one by one and see how many you remember from top of your head. So in my first reaction here I'm adding two hydrogens to the carbons of my alkene and I'm seeing that those two hydrogens are added at the same direction or from the same face of the molecule so that is what we are going to referred to as a syn addition. And we know that the reaction that gives the syn addition of hydrogens to a double bond is going to be hydrogenation. So our reagents in this case are going to be hydrogen and some sort of a catalyst. When it comes to our catalyst, we actually have quite a few different options. We can do platinum or we can do palladium or we can do palladium that has been chemically depleted on carbon, or we can also do nickel, and there is about a million of other ones that we can use, but these are going to be the most common ones that you are most likely seeing in your course. So all of those are going to be our heterogeneous catalysts, and within the scope of our course it really doesn't matter which one you are going to choose, so you can grab whichever. Now, in my next reaction, I have bromine attached over here, which is going to be a more substitute carbon of my alkene, which means that we are going to be doing a regular hydrohalogenation with HBr. In this case we can use HBr if we are going to be adding bromine to our molecule, but you can also see HCl and HI. There is also something really important that you gotta remember about this reaction, is that this reaction goes through the formation of the carbocation intermediate, and that means that we are always going to be checking for any possible carbocation rearrangements. Remember, if a carbocation cation can rearrange to give you a more stable carbocation, it absolutely will. So whenever you have a carbocation as an intermediate, always make sure that you are going to check for any possible carbocation rearrangements before doing anything else. So to give you a quick example, if I have a molecule like this, for instance, and I'm going to do the reaction with HBr, first what I'm going to do is the electrophilic uh, attack on my alkene, which is going to give me the corresponding carbocation. In this case, it is going to be a secondary carbocation, which is right next to a tertiary position, which means that we are going to see a very quick carbocation rearrangement, which is going to be a hydride shift in this case, giving us a more stable tertiary carbocation over here, and only after that the Br-, which is our nucleophile in the system, going to attack our carbocation, giving us the final product looking like this. Also, since bromine is going to end up on the more substituted carbon of our alkene, the reactions that going to give you this regioselectivity are said to follow the Markovnikov rule and give you the corresponding Markovnikov product. And as I have already mentioned in one of my previous videos on the Markovnikov rule, when it comes to the modern interpretation of the Markovnikov rule, the electrophilic addition to alkenes always proceeds through the formation of the most stable carbocation, which means that for as long as you are thinking about your carbocation stability, you should arrive to the correct product without thinking whether it's a Markovnikov for anti-Markovnikov products. All right, so in my next example, bromine is actually sitting on the less 
substituted carbon of what used to be a double bond. And in this case, in order to accomplish something like that, we're also going to be doing the hydrohalogenation, so reaction with HBr, but now we need to do this reaction in the presence of organic peroxides. Typically, we are going to abbreviate our peroxide as ROOR, and we'll need a little bit of heat to keep this reaction going. Keep in mind that this reaction is a radical mechanism, so we are going to be seeing radical intermediates, and when it comes to the radical reactions, we are always going to be using our fish hook arrows or half arrows. So when it comes to drawing these reactions, always be very careful with how exactly you are showing your mechanisms. Alright, in the next one, I have my OH group sitting on the less substituted carbon again. And we know that if we want to add the OH to the less substituted carbon, it's not going to be a simple hydration, that is going to be our fancy hydroboration oxidation reaction. And when it comes to the hydroboration oxidation, that is going to be a two-step process. Step number one is going to be reaction with the borane, BH3, typically in the presence of the oxygen-containing ether-like solvent, like THF or anhydrous ether, and then the second step there is going to be the oxidation part, which is typically done by the hydrogen peroxide, so that's going to be H2O2 in basic media, so I'm going to show OH-, and that base can be either a sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, it doesn't really matter what sort of a base you are going to use in that case. The other important thing about this reaction, though, is that both OH and the hydrogen that we have in this reaction are going to be added to our molecule from the same side of the molecule. So that means that this is also going to be a syn addition reaction that can be very important for the stereochemistry. Like, for instance, in this particular case, upon addition of our hydrogen and the OH group to our molecule, we have, in fact, creating two chiral carbons. And because of that, we can have attack from the front face or the back face that I'm currently showing. So because of that, we are going to show a pair of enantiomers for the product. So if I wanted to show the correct mixture of my product, I would show the one that I'm already showing there and the corresponding enantiomer. Since a lot of instructors do point out the stereochemical outcomes of these reactions and, in fact, they do test those, make sure that you always show the corresponding relationship between your products or if your instructor is not asking to show all possible uh, stereoisomers, whether they are enantiomers or diastereomers, then you probably would want to write plus a corresponding enantiomer or something of, you know, that sort. Also remember that is not always going to be an enantiomer. Pay attention to your molecule, because occasionally it can be a diastereomer instead of an enantiomer. So it really depends on the structure of the molecule itself. Now, in my next reaction, I do have OH on the more substituted carbon, and that can be either a simple hydration, and if I want to do a simple hydration reaction, I would just do a reaction with water, H2O, in the presence of some sort of an acid catalyst, so I will just show it as an H plus. Or, alternatively, I can do the oxymercuration reduction reaction, which is sometimes called oxymercuration demercuration, which is the same thing for our purposes. So that one is a two-step process, where in the first step you're going to react your alkene with mercury 2+, typically that mercury 2+, is going to be in the form of mercury acetate, so most likely we are going to see something like HgOAc twice, that is done in aqueous media, so we are going to have H2O there present as well, and often you are going to have a little bit of sulfuric acid there added as well, because the reaction does require a little bit of an acid uh, during the mechanism itself to make it work a little bit better. And then the second part, where we are going to do the demercuration itself, that one is typically done by the base sodium uh, hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, and the reducing agent that is going to be typically sodium borohydride, so something like NaBH4. Now, as you already know, we don't introduce reactions in organic chemistry just for the fun of it. Every reaction that we show you has a certain purpose. So the hydration, while it is a very simple reaction, has carbocations in the mechanism, which means that we can potentially have carbocation rearrangements. 
On contrary, the oxymercuration has no carbocations, which means that if you have a sensitive compound that can potentially rearrange, maybe your double bond is somewhere in the middle of the molecule and the rearrangement is going to be very likely, well, in that case, if you're going to use the oxymercuration, then you're not going to see any rearrangement and you're going to get the product that you intend. So remember that when you are going to be adding your OH to the more substituted carbon, or in other words, you're getting your Markovnikov alcohol, then you have an option of either hydration or oxymercuration and you should choose whichever reaction fits your needs better. If you are not afraid of uh, any carbocation rearrangements, then you should use simple hydration. If a carbocation rearrangement is possible and you do not want to see that, then we should do the oxymercuration reduction reaction. In my next reaction, I am adding bromines across the double bond. So in this case, that's going to be just a simple halogenation reaction in which I am just going to be reacting my alkene with something like Br2 or Cl2 or maybe even I2 if I really wanted to. The important thing to keep in mind about this reaction is that there are no carbocations, which means that there are going to be no rearrangements, and also this reaction is going to put both halogens anti to each other, so this is what we refer to as a strict anti-addition, which is going to be relevant in most cases uh, when it comes to the stereochemistry of your molecule, that is, of course. So you'll need to make sure that you are mentioning the stereochemistry when you are dealing with your reaction. So in this case, I'm going to get this product, plus, of course, the corresponding enantiomer for this one. All right, in my next reaction, I'm adding the bromine atom and I'm also adding the OH to my molecule at the same time. We commonly refer to this type of a product as a halo hydrine. And those ones are the result of the reaction that we refer to as hydrohalogenation. So we do the hydrohalogenation by treating our alkene with bromine in the presence of a solvent, which in this case is going to be excess of water. In this case, the bromine is going to be my electrophile, while the water is going to be my nucleophile. So, based on the Markovnikov rule or general mechanistic understanding of how the electrophilic addition to alkenes work, we will know that the electrophile is going to go to the less substituted atom of our double bond, why the nucleophile is going to end up on the more substituted atom correspondingly. This reaction is also a strict anti-addition, meaning that both OH and the Br, or halogen in general, going to end up looking in the opposite directions or being trans to each other in the final product. Now, the next reaction is probably one of the most fun ones. We have a cyclic molecule, we have an alkene, and then we've done a cleavage of that alkene, breaking the double bond. So, I have one, two, three, four, five, six atoms in my product, and I also have one, two, three, four, five, six atoms in my starting material. What I've done here is that I cut through the double bond over here. So if I number my atoms as one, two, three, four, five, and six, those same atoms are going to be one, two, three, four, five, and six over here like that. So, in order to cleave through the double bond, in order to cut through the double bond, the most common reaction that we are going to be using is going to be the ozonolysis. So, when it comes to our ozonolysis, the first step is going to be reaction with the ozone itself. Then, we are going to have a workup step. In this case, I have formed an aldehyde, which means that that is a reductive ozonolysis, so we are going to have a reductive workup. And for the reductive workup, we are either going to be seeing being DMS, which stands for dimethyl sulfide, a molecule that looks like this, or an alternative in this case is going to be zinc in acid, so zinc in HCl, or maybe zinc in um, acetic acid, or something of that sort. Some instructors go as far as just saying zinc, while it is not going to be just, you know, hunk of metal there, uh, it's going to be usually zinc dust, or zinc turning, or shavings, and we're going to be adding acid there to break the oxide film on top of the zinc, on the zinc surface, otherwise it's just not going to be very reactive. The most important thing to 
to keep in mind when it comes to the azanolysis, though, is to keep track of your atoms. It is really easy to lose atoms or add a few extra ones. Make sure you number your atoms and you can find all the atoms from the starting material in your final product. So the next reaction adds a three-membered ring with an oxygen to my molecule. And the name for this functional group is going to be the epoxide. Thus, we are looking at the epoxidation reaction. The most typical epoxidation reaction that we are going to be seeing within the scope of our course is going to be epoxidation with peroxy acids. So you are going to need some sort of peroxy acid, all of which going to have a very similar structure like that. We have some sort of R group connected to our COOOH and the nature of the R group is not the most relevant part here. However, some instructors do insist that you know exactly which peroxy acids you are going to use. So it can be peroxyacetic acid or MCPBA or something like that. So for instance, if we are talking about the MCPBA, that's going to be the molecule that looks like this, where MCPBA stands for metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. And as I've mentioned, there are other options as well depending on which ones your instructor likes and which ones uh, you have covered in your course, you may need to know a few of those. But MCPBA is definitely the most common one, so you definitely need to know that one. Another thing that I want to point out about this reaction is that this is a syn addition, so anything that was on your double bond is going to be pushed on one or the other side of the molecule. And finally, I have one other reaction that also adds a three-membered ring to my system, but in this case that is a three-membered ring with a carbon. So that is just a simple cyclopropane. And since we are adding a cyclopropane ring to our molecule, the reaction is also going to be called cyclopropanation. The most common one that you are going to see within the scope of your course is going to be called the Siemens-Smith reaction, which is going to be the reaction of an alkene with the CH2I2 in the presence of zinc copper alloy, which is going to convert this CH2I2 into a funny looking structure and make a cyclopropane ring. Many instructors don't even cover the mechanism of this reaction, but if you do, I do have a video about that that explains how this mechanism works in every single little detail that you need to know about that. Now, how many of these reactions did you remember from top of your head? Did you know all of them or did you forget some of them? For as long as you are doing a deliberate practice and you are pointing your attention towards any reaction that you have forgotten, you are going to be less likely to forget about that reaction during the exam or during the homework or quiz or anything of that sort. So the next time when you are reviewing your reactions, try this spider web method and see how much easier it will be to remember all of your reactions. And another awesome thing about the spider webs is that once you are done with the spider web, then you can take one of your molecules, let's say we're going to take this bromide over here and create a spider web around this one. So from here we are going to have a whole bunch of other reactions and see where those reactions take us. This way the spider web going to keep on growing and making more and more interesting transformations. This way it will be much easier for you not only to remember the reactions themselves, but also to see how the reactions can change to accomplish different synthetic transformations, and at the end of the course you are always going to be tested on the multi-step synthesis, and if you have already tried these uh, spider webs multiple times, if you have practiced with those, then accomplishing the synthesis is going to be significantly easier. So have you ever tried to do the spider webs for your reactions before? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you found this video useful, give it a like so YouTube algorithm promotes it and more students see it. Subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates. Watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.